pandemic. Surely it's our ability to have these accessible uh, seminars uh, that bring us together. Uh, so it's wonderful to be here and I will be talking about two classes of automata, history deterministic and good for games automata in the quantitative setting. So these are two uh, intermediate automata models that are in between deterministic and non-deterministic ones. Now I'm interested in such models because usually when we work with automata, if we have to choose between deterministic and non-deterministic automata, we have this trade-off that deterministic automata are usually very well behaved. Uh, we can do lots of nice things like complement them, use them in various algorithms. Uh, but then on the other hand, uh, they tend to be less expressive or at least less succinct than non-deterministic automata, which have a lot of more expressive power. Um, so then it's interesting to look at models in between where we can sometimes combine some of the nice algorithmic properties of deterministic automata with some of the power of non-determinism. And today I'll talk about two such intermediate models, history -determ determinism and uh, good for gameness. Um, and well, I've studied these in the setting of regular automata uh, where these two things are the same thing. Uh, but it turns out that they are not the same thing in the quantitative setting. So this talk will take you through what each of these are, uh, how they differ, and how each of them might be interesting. Uh, this is based on joint work with Udi Bukka uh, from Herzliya in Israel. Uh, and there's some references that are available on archive, should you be interested. Uh, so let's first agree on what I mean with quantitative automata. So when, in this talk, when I talk about quantitative automata, I talk about an automaton that has some states where um, a trans all transitions are associated with some weight. Uh, so that when I read a word over the finite input alphabet, uh, I get a run or perhaps several runs and the run induces a sequence of weights. Uh, and then I have some payoff function, which depending on whether I'm on finite words or infinite words, uh, maps a sequence of either a finite number of weights or an infinite number of weights into a real uh, value. So this is an accumulator, which for example, takes the sum of all of my weights or takes the supremum, uh, the infimum, the average, the limit average, the mean payoff, whatever. Um, so that is the type of creature I will be talking about today. Uh, in this example, uh, I have a non-deterministic quantitative automaton, where when I read uh, from the initial state, I can, when I read a B, I can either stay in this initial state where uh, whatever I read, I get a weight zero, or I can non-deterministically uh, choose to move into the middle state, which is able to read A's and see the weight one until the next B is read, after which we only get weight zero. Uh, so we run off this automaton uh, if we read it as a sum automaton. So if we take our payoff function to be uh, sum, uh, then what this a run of this automaton does, it uh, measures the length of an A log. And then a word might have several runs over it. And we say that the value of uh, the word by the automaton is the supremum among the runs. So in this case, if we have a finite word, this automaton assigns to the finite word the length of the longest A block that is uh, in between two Bs. Okay. Um, the reason I like this, well, the reason I want to talk about this type of quantitative automata is that most of the things that I'm going to talk about are also, can be also done with alternating automata, in which case, in addition to non-deterministic choice, I might have some universal choices, and then the semantics of my automaton are given by a game where one player is trying to maximize 
uh, the value and one player is trying to minimize. Um, but I won't go into detail about the alternating parameter. It's just something to keep in mind. Uh, so with that being said, let's now talk about this notion of history determinism. So the main thing you need to know about history determinism, uh, it is automata that are non-deterministic, but where the non-determinism only depends on the past. That's the motto um, that we have for history determinism. What that means in practice, I'll show you with this uh, toy example. Uh, here I have a pair of very simple automata. They are quantitative, since we are working with quantitative automata, uh, where in the topmost automaton, we first either see a weight 10 or a weight zero, according to what the input letter is. And then for the second transition, we have a non-deterministic choice that allows us to choose which weight we want to see. Now, the payoff function I have is a bit of a non-standard one here, uh, which assigns to a run the difference of the two values of the runs, uh, the two values of the transitions. Uh, so this means that uh, here, my non-deterministic choice, uh, I should choose uh, the transition which has the value that is different from uh, the previous transition so that uh, the value of my run will be uh, 10. Uh, so the topmost automaton for any input word of length two uh, will have a run that has value 10. Uh, the bottom automaton is almost exactly the same, except this time the non-deterministic choice happens at the start where we can choose uh, the weight of the transition. And uh, the second transition depends on the input letter. Uh, it should be fairly easy to see that this uh, computes exactly the same function. It also assigns the value 10 to all two letter words. However, the non-determinism in these two automata is somehow fundamentally different. In the first one, uh, the non-deterministic choice uh, depends on what the previous transition was. So if I previously saw uh, had value 10, now I should pick zero. If I previously had zero, now I should pick 10. Uh, so it only depends on the past, um, on the history of what has happened so far. So we can say that this first automaton is history deterministic according to our intuition. Now in the second one, on the other hand, we have to make this non-deterministic choice first before we know what the second transition will be. So it requires this notion of non-deterministic guessing of the future of our word. So this is not history deterministic. This might look like a fairly innocuous difference, uh, but it turns out that it matters for algorithmic purposes. Uh, the history deterministic version of this automaton will be much better behaved. It will uh, behave in the various contexts as if it was a deterministic automaton, while the second one will not. Um, and that's what will why we're interested in this notion of history determinism. We can formalize this by saying that an automaton is history deterministic if it has a resolver. And a resolver is a function which looks at what has happened so far. So the run, a prefix of a run of the automaton, a next input letter, and it outputs a transition telling me this is the transition I should choose in my automaton next. Uh, so this is a function that is able to build uh, letter by letter, transition by transition, um, a run. Uh, and it should be the case that it induces a run that has the value of my word uh, as assigned by the automaton for each word. Uh, so essentially we're saying we should be able to build an optimal run without having to guess the future of the word. Uh, equivalently, if you like games, we can think of this as a strategy in the following letter game. Uh, in this letter game, Adam plays at each turn some input letter from our input alphabet, and Eve has to respond with some transition 
over this letter. Uh, and now we say that Eve wins if she manages to build a run that has the value of Adam's word. Uh, and a strategy in this game is exactly a result of function. So um, depending on whether you like anthropomorphizing fun functions, uh, you might like to think of this as a game. Okay. Um, so in particular, one thing to note is that in the quantitative setting, since the value of a word is the supremum among all of its runs, if we have an infinite number of runs uh, which converge to some value, then maybe there is no one run that actually uh, has this uh, supreme value, in which case the automaton cannot be good for games for kind of trivial reasons. Uh, why we care about this notion of history determinism? Well, uh, in various settings, it can be more expressive than determinism. So it gives us a larger class of properties that we can describe. It can also put, uh, describe properties more succinctly. Uh, so for example, uh, for a pushdown automaton, uh, history deterministic ones are more expressive. And already for omega regular Kobuchi automata, uh, they are more succinct. Uh, however, despite being more powerful, they often behave like deterministic automata, uh, which means we can use them instead of deterministic automata and avoid determinization, which we all know is notoriously difficult. Uh, in particular, they behave like determinism in the sense that they are what we call good for games. We can use them for solving games. Uh, and that's bring us to the second notion of this tool, which is the notion of good for gameness. Uh, so it is a consequence of history determinism, uh, and we'll now talk about that in more details. So recall that the motto for history determinism was that we can make our non-deterministic choices based only on the past. Well, our motto for good for gameness is that composing my automaton with games should work as expected. Now, uh, work as expected, uh, we can understand that uh, as if the automaton was deterministic. So in general, deterministic uh, automata, we often compose them with various objects, including games, they are well behaved, and uh, we would like uh, our automaton to be equally well behaved as a deterministic one. Uh, so let's uh, I'll explain what exactly that means. Uh, since we are in the quantitative setting, we are going to talk about quantitative games, where we have two players that play on some arena, where some positions belong to one player, others belong to another player, to the other player, and they each move a token, building a path in this arena. Uh, and every time they make a move, they produce some letter, and in the limit, they build a word. <laughs> and the value of the play corresponds to the value of this word as assigned by some payoff function, which conveniently we will have represented by some quantitative automaton. And now we have one player who I'll call Eve, who tries to maximize this value. So she tries to play a word that has a high value uh, and her opponent, of course, tries to minimize the value. Uh, for example, uh, here we have an automaton, oh no, here we have a game, uh, where we can have as payoff function the automaton from earlier that assigns to words the length of the longest A block. Uh, here we have squares belonging to Adam, who tries to minimize, so uh, build a word that has only short blocks of A's, and circles belong to Eve, who tries to force a word that has a long block of A's. Uh, now, if you stare at this again for a while, you might agree with me that Adam, uh, his optimal strategy, well, he doesn't have a choice from the initial node. Uh, from his other position, he has a choice of either going into an A loop. Uh, so from his other position, he could go into an A loop, which doesn't sound great. Uh, so his optimal strategy will be to go to the right where he can guarantee that only two A's 
will occur in her body. Eve, on the other hand, uh, her optimal strategy will be uh, to go down and here to go up. And thus, Eve can guarantee that there is a word of, with an A block of length three, and Adam can guarantee that there is no A block longer than three. So the value of this game is three. Okay. Uh, so then, if we want to compose such a game with an automaton, uh, we just take uh, the product in the following sense. So we'll have a game of which the positions correspond to both the position in this original game and a state of the automaton we compose it with. We still have moves in the original game. And whenever uh, we move, make such a move, uh, this produces a letter that gets fed into the automaton. And the automaton uh, processes this letter uh, to produce a transition. And since our automaton might be non-deterministic, we will have a choice of transitions, and this choice will be given to Eve. So Eve has to not only move in the game, we also ask her to choose a transition over uh, each letter that gets produced in the original game. So now a play in this composition game is both a play in the original game and a run in the automaton. And the value of the pay uh, of the play will be the payoff of this run according to our automaton. Again, Eve tries to maximize, Adam tries to minimize. So what happens here is that Eve has to not only uh, try to build a word that has high value in the original game, she also has to produce a run that uh, displays that high value in the automaton letter by letter as uh, the game progresses. And now we say that an automaton A is good for games if for all games with a payoff automaton A, um, the game, original game, and the product of the game with the payoff automaton uh, have the same value. Now here I am assuming that the original game is determined. If it's not determined, then we can talk in more detail about uh, the value for each player being preserved, but for simplicity, let's say that our original game is determined, and so it has a value, and uh, we would like the composition to preserve this value. So let's uh, work through an example. Uh, here is the same game as earlier, and here is the automaton. Uh, and here what happens in the product is that, well, the first move will be Adam taking this B, uh, B move in the game. And uh, now Eve has to choose which transition she will process this B with. Uh, so she essentially has to decide whether the next block of A's will be the, uh, the long one. Uh, now, for, thankfully for her, she controls the next position of the play. So she can decide whether in the next position, she might come back to the initial state and see a short block of A's, in which case she could uh, hang out in the initial state of the automaton for a bit. Um, and then when she decides to transition into the middle state of the automaton, then she can guarantee this uh, block of A's of length at least three, uh, which the automaton uh, will then have a run that has value three. Uh, so in this case, the value of the game is three and the value of the composition is also three. So here the composition preserved the value. However, this is not always the case. For example, here I have a slightly different game where Adam has a choice after playing the initial B of either reading uh, two A's in a row or first reading one A and in a row and then reading two A's in a row. Uh, so here, the value of this game is two because in either case, the longest A block is of length two. However, now if we look at the composition, 
uh, what happens is that when Adam plays the first transition, Eve has to decide whether uh, she wants to move in the middle state or not. If she does move into the middle state and start counting the A's, then Adam can choose this path where the first block of A's is short and the second one is longer, which will result in a play that has value one. If on the other hand, Eve decides to stay in the initial state, then Adam can move uh, and get uh, play uh, the two A's immediately uh, and the run that Eve has built will then have value zero. Uh, so the composition of, the two of, of this game and this automaton uh, has value one. So here the value of the composition is not the same as the value of the game. So in other words, this automaton here is not good for games. Uh, which maybe wasn't that surprising. We said it was not history deterministic. Well, history determinism implies good for gameness, um, but this one doesn't seem to be either. Okay, so why is this an interesting property of automata? Well, essentially what this composition operation does, it takes a game which has some fairly arbitrary payoff function, that is described by an automaton. So it can be fairly complicated and we don't necessarily have an algorithm to solve all games with all kinds of different payoff functions. Uh, so it reduces solving that game to solving a game with the payoff function given by our automata's um, type. So we might end up with a discounted sum game or a sum game or a sub game. Uh, which are uh, much better understood objects. So we're reducing uh, arbitrarily strange payoff uh, game with an arbitrary strange payoff function into a game with a well understood one, uh, which we can then solve with standard algorithms. Uh, this is particularly useful for the problem of quantitative uh, synthesis, uh, which we can think of as a game between an environment player that play some input letters to which a system player responds with some output letters, uh, thus building an interaction, a global behavior uh, consisting of these pairs of input output letters. Uh, and then the system, we can ask the system to guarantee some properties about this global behavior. Uh, so the outcome of the game is uh, this interaction to which we can assign some payoff using the quantitative automaton. And this pay on, payoff might describe uh, the cost or the, how the utility of the interaction, how desirable it is, uh, or various other quantitative aspects of the real world. So for example, maybe the environment is um, sending in some request for resources and the system is asked to schedule resources and uh, our payoff function tells us about the costs of various operations or the utility, how desirable a schedule might be um, and such things. Uh, now in this setting, we can ask various questions and one of them is, well, what is the maximum payoff that a system can guarantee? So here we ask the system to uh, maximize the worst case behavior. So assuming an antagonistic environment, uh, what guarantee can the system give about the outcome of this interaction? Uh, and to solve this problem, well, this is a quantitative game. Uh, to solve this problem, uh, we can do the composition we did earlier. So in particular, if our payoff is described by a good for games automaton, then we can solve this game via the composition strategy. Uh, now, history determinism and good for games were both uh, kind of introduced in the Omega regular setting. Uh, these two terms arose independently. Uh, they, the same notion was defined several times because it's quite a, a natural 
uh, notion to define. Um, and it turns out that, well, both of these notions, they coincide in the omega regular setting. So uh, history determinism kind of easily implies good for gameness, but it happens that uh, it characterizes good for gameness in the sense that um, an automaton has these nice compositional properties exactly if it is history deterministic. Uh, so these two terms have been used kind of interchangeably in the regular setting. And uh, so when we started studying what happens in the quantitative setting, uh, we were a little bit surprised to find out that actually uh, in the, here they no longer coincide. But the um, example that separates them is very simple. So I'll show that to you now. Here we have an automaton where we have an initial non-deterministic choice uh, between a position that assigns weight one to all the letters and a position that assigns weight two to A and weight zero to B. Uh, so essentially, so here of course, words where the second letter is A have a value two, uh, while the words where the second letter is B have value one. Uh, and this is clearly not history deterministic because this non-deterministic choice has to guess whether the second letter will be an A or a B and make the non-deterministic choice accordingly. However, it turns out that it is good for games. Why is this? Well, if we have a game, then either Eve has a strategy that guarantees that the second letter is an A, in which case the game has value two, or she doesn't, in which case the game has value one. Uh, so then in the composition of the game, any game with this automaton, uh, if Eve can guarantee that the second letter is the A, then she can safely go down and get payoff. Uh, build a run with payoff two uh, and thus preserve the value of the game. While if she knows that she can't guarantee that the second letter is A, then she can go into the topmost state from where she can guarantee a run with payoff one. So in either case, she can guarantee uh, the value of the game. So this automaton is good for games, but it is not history deterministic. Uh, now, thinking about what exactly is going on in this automaton, uh, we have this idea of uh, thresholds. So uh, the game kind of gives us a threshold that Eve has to guess to aim for. Uh, so to better understand the relationship between history determinism and good for gameness, it turns out to be useful to think about quantitative automata with thresholds. So if we have a quantitative automaton, so that assigns uh, values to words, um, if we add a threshold, what we get is a Boolean automaton that recognizes the, what I'll call the threshold language of the quantitative automaton, uh, which corresponds just to words of which the value is above the threshold. Uh, and then we have a Boolean automaton. Um, this also, uh, this is a useful notion for um, when we apply this notion of threshold to our synthesis problem. So maybe in, uh, we call this environment versus system game in the synthesis problem. Uh, maybe we don't really care about um, what exact value the system can guarantee. Maybe we just want the system to guarantee uh, some threshold value. Uh, we can apply this threshold notion to the notion of beautiful gameness and ask that uh, the composition preserves whether a game, the value of a game is above the threshold or not. And finally, we can apply thresholds to history determinism and ask that the resolver uh, manages that should build a run that matches uh, the threshold for all words that have value of at least threshold. So this is uh, exactly the definition of history determinism on a Boolean automaton applied to uh, this quantitative automaton with a threshold. 
uh, except we do have a for all thresholds in this definition. So we say that monothematism is threshold history deterministic if it is history deterministic for all thresholds, meaning if all of the Boolean automata that we get by adding thresholds to this automaton, if they are all history deterministic. Okay, so now I have a bunch of extra notions by adding thresholds to everything. Uh, why, why do I care about this? Well, it brings some clarity to the relationship between our different notions in the following sense. Uh, it turns out that good for gameness and threshold good for gameness, they are exactly the same thing for one. Uh, however, the example I gave you, that was an example that showed that uh, threshold history determinism is not the same thing as history determinism. Uh, so history determinism, of course, implies uh, threshold history determinism, but as our example showed, uh, there's a difference between having a strategy for each separate value and having a strategy that maximizes uh, the value for all words. So here we have a separation. And then what happens in between threshold good for gameness and threshold history determinism? Well, threshold history determinism implies threshold good for gameness. Um, intuitively, because if I have a resolver, then I can use the resolver in the composition game to play on the automata side, which guarantees that the composition achieves uh, the right value. For the other direction, I do have an implication if the letter game is determined. So recall this letter game where Adam pays letters and Eve uh, is trying to build a run. Where, well, if that game is determined, which is the case in particular for all automata or the finite words, then uh, there is a correspondence between threshold good for gameness and threshold good for determinism. If it is not determined, then I don't know. Then I would like to find a different proof strategy to show this equivalence. So that is still open. Uh, now to relate this picture with uh, some related notions, we have uh, the notion of determinizability by pruning, which is quite similar to history determinism, except it requires uh, this resolver to be positional in the automaton. Uh, so we don't allow this resolver to have any kind of memory. Uh, and essentially what this means is that you can just remove transitions from your automaton and uh, get a deterministic automaton that preserves the function. Uh, and this occasionally for simple enough automata will be equivalent to history determinism, but not in general. Um, so it also implies history determinism, but the other way around is not true. Uh, and uh, finally, this is also the case, we can also consider the threshold version of this problem uh, that requires um, determinizing but uh, into an automaton that just preserves uh, the, whether words achieve a threshold value or not, uh, which uh, does not imply determinizability by pruning. Uh, so that is uh, the picture. So since we have all of these different notions, it's reasonable to ask, well, which ones are the ones that we should care about, if any? And I'd argue that, well, history determinism is uh, perhaps, is definitely a notion that I care about. Uh, why is that? Well, we said that it implies good for gameness. It is stronger than good for gameness. Uh, but it still has all the nice properties that uh, if I have history determinism, I can solve games. Uh, now, if I could work with good for gameness, that might that give, would give me more automata. But unfortunately, the definition of good for gameness has this universal quantification over all games, which is not something that's very easy to work with. However, history determinism is defined via this uh, kind of fairly simple two-player game, which is in some ways easier to handle. So 
I would reckon that history determinism in general is going to be easier uh, to decide and uh, easier to work with. And I would also argue that as a notion of non-determinism, it is interesting in its own right. So the, um, the composition with gains aspect is a kind of functional definition saying, well, this is what I can do with an automaton. Um, which is very useful, but the definition of history determinism in, is in some ways quite natural. Um, and I would argue that is, is therefore interesting in its own right. However, it turns out that it also has uh, some very nice applications, uh, which I will describe to you now. Uh, so let's revisit once again our quantitative uh, synthesis problem. Now, if you recall, uh, last time I said that we could ask whether, what are the guarantees that the system can give? So what is the value uh, if the environment plays in the most antagonistic possible way? And I'm asking what guarantees can the system give about that value? Now, if that's the only thing I ask, uh, I'm actually asking the system very little um, because well, I'm assuming the environment is antagonistic, which quite often we don't live in a completely hostile world. Sometimes good things happen too. And in those scenarios, my previous synthesis problem allowed my uh, system to do to behave suboptimally, as in for all the other behaviors, apart from this worst case behavior, my system could do pretty much anything it wants, as long as it's no worse than this worst case uh, scenario. Uh, so that's not ideal, uh, and in particular, if uh, quite often there are scenarios where the environment is able to force some very, very bad outcome. Uh, for example, if you're trying to have a self-driving car that you would like to get it to get you to your destination uh, while um, using as little fuel as possible, it might be the case that there's a roadblock well, it could be the case that there's a roadblock and you're, you might not even be able to get to your destination at all, uh, which then would have a very poor payoff. This uh, scenario has a terrible payoff and there is no way the system can uh, categorically prevent it from happening because it is absolutely not the system's fault if there is a roadblock. Uh, and what this means for our synthesis problem is that uh, if we only ask the system to consider this worst case behavior, it can do whatever it wants on all of the days when there is no uh, roadblock. So instead of this kind of traditional synthesis question, we can ask, well, can the system achieve the best possible value for every input, which is a version of this problem that accounts for the fact that sometimes the environment might just be uh, really terrible and we also want to care about what happens on the good days. Uh, so this is called the best value synthesis. At least that's what I've seen it called in the literature. Uh, and it turns out that solving the best value synthesis problem, uh, if my specification, the payoff function, is given by a deterministic quantitative automaton, is linearly equivalent to deciding whether a non-deterministic automaton of the same type is history deterministic. Uh, this is a very simple uh, reduction, uh, which I spend maybe a couple of minutes just showing you how very simple it is. If I want to know whether an automaton is history deterministic, I can check whether the following deterministic automaton is uh, best value realizable. I will take my automaton A, which um, is over some input alphabet sigma. And now uh, I will add to the input alphabet uh, the transitions of my automaton. And this will give me a deterministic automaton that reads uh, runs of A and maps them to their value in A. So it's a fairly boring automaton. Uh, it is deterministic and it has the property that a solution to the best value synthesis problem is exactly the same thing as a witness of history determinism in our original automaton. Conversely, if I want to know whether an automaton 
is best, best value realizable, so whether uh, I have a solution to the synthesis problem, then I can ch check whether the following automaton is history deterministic. So recall that the uh, original automaton is over some pairs, input output pairs. Uh, and now I can project that onto just the first component. So just the input letters. Uh, and this, if my original automaton was deterministic, if I project away the second component, I will get one transition. So a non-deterministic choice per output letter. And what this uh, non-deterministic automaton does, it maps input behaviors to the best value since my automaton takes the supremum among all runs. Uh, and it has this property that it is history deterministic if and only if the original automaton has a solution to the best value synthesis problem. And this witness has the same complexity as the solution to the synthesis problem. Uh, what this means, well, it motivates the question of deciding whether an automaton is history deterministic, because uh, for the price of solving one decision procedure, you also get a solution to the synthesis problem. So that's some motivation. And it also motivates uh, the study of the complexity of these resolver objects. Uh, in fact, for quite a, like so, so far, when we've studied uh, history determinism, the complexity of the resolvers hasn't been very important because when we use history determinism to solve games, the complexity of the resolver doesn't matter. It can be, uh, it might be the case that the resolver is exponential, um, but when it comes to solving the game, just the existence of the resolver uh, means that this reduction works, and then we can solve the game, and the complexity of the solving the game problem has nothing to do with the complexity of the resolver. So somehow this complexity goes away and disappears and we could, thought we could ignore it. But it turns out that it is an interesting parameter in this synthesis problem. Uh, so perhaps we should pay some attention to it. Um, now deciding history determinism, it can be challenging. Uh, I mentioned that this letter game that characterizes it well, it might not be determined, which of course is not the end of the world, but it's easier to work with determined gains. Um, and what's the difficulty is that the winning condition of this game, it compares a run against the value of the word that the run is built on. Um, and well, we don't know what the value of the word is unless we somehow run, say, a deterministic automaton on it. However, determinization in the quantitative setting is not always possible. And even if it is possible, uh, it might have high complexity. And anyway, comparing two runs uh, that have some uh, value computed by some payoff function might also be uh, not completely trivial. So there's a lot of uh, difficulties to overcome to do this, but there is some hope. And uh, this will be my last. Uh, point. So in the, the question of deciding history determinism has been studied in the omega regular setting uh, with some intensity, um, in particular by Danny Kupperberg and Michal Shipshek and Mark Benyan. Uh, and one of the very successful approaches uh, has been of using so-called token games, where the idea is that instead of playing this letter game, where the winning condition talks about this optimal run, which we don't have access to. Uh, instead, we ask Adam to also build some number of runs. So we have k tokens that Adam has to also move around to build k um, runs. And the idea is that Adam has to, in the Boolean setting, Adam has to prove that the word is in the language by building an, at least one accepting run in, with one of his tokens. So we have an accepting condition, which is now that either Eve's run is accepting or all of Adam's runs are accepting, uh, are rejecting. And this is easier to compute because we can actually com compare concrete uh, runs. We just have a Boolean combination of uh, whether some runs are accepting or not. And uh, that is 
in the omega regular setting that is polynomially computable. Uh, and here uh, in this paper, Bernier and Kuberberg showed that uh, the two token game. So if here we have two runs, uh, then um, then the two token game, which they call G2, uh, that characterizes history determinism for Buhi automata. And later we showed that it also characterizes it for co Buhi automata. So then we can solve the simpler game instead of trying to solve the letter game. Uh, so the idea in the quantitative setting would be to take this approach and see what happens. Uh, so we can trans we can also use these uh, token games in the quantitative setting just by saying that Eve runs, uh, Eve wins if she manages to build a run that is uh, at least as large as the maximum among all of Adam's runs. Uh, and it turns out that already the one token game where Adam just has to build one run uh, is equivalent characterizes history determinism over quantitative automata over finite words. And uh, we also managed to show that the two token game characterizes history determinism of lim inf and lim sub automata. Uh, so this is a kind of beginning, some success uh, in taking these methods from the omega regular setting and extending them to the quantitative one. Uh, and it's available on archive. Uh, unpublished otherwise. Uh, so yes, the hope is that perhaps we can use these uh, techniques to uh, extend these techniques um, to get more of these um, solutions. Um, okay, uh, I'll just mention a couple of related notions that I have not worked very much on, but uh, should definitely be mentioned. Uh, in the quantitative setting, it's quite natural to talk about approximations. Uh, so it, there is a notion of R regret determinization, which is a question of can we determinize an automaton, for example, by pruning into an automaton where the value of words is never much worse than it was in the original one, uh, much better worth being defined by some parameter called the regret. Uh, similarly, uh, there's the notion of uh, bounded regret synthesis, um, which is also uh, very close to this, which of course implies the notion of uh, this parametrized approximative history determinism and good for gameness, which um, has not been explored, but clearly there's a gap there. Uh, so I'll conclude on that. So this talk I've been uh, telling a little bit about the, what has happened when we've tried to take notions from the Boolean setting of history determinism and good for gameness uh, to uh, the quantitative setting. And well, what happened is we noticed that uh, some things are very different, for in particular, good for gameness and history determinism do not coincide anymore. Uh, however, it turns out that they are relevant to various notions. Uh, that um, are rather interesting, such as the best value synthesis. Uh, and the hope is that we can address some of those problems using extending techniques from the Boolean setting. And on the other hand, uh, adapting some of the things we, some of the research that has happened in the quantitative setting and trying to learn something from that uh, to better understand history determinism. Um, that's all from me today. So I'll thank you for being here and I'll be available for discussions um, should you have questions or comments. Thank you very much. So thank you so much, Carolina. It was a very interesting talk. And uh, as being an outsider of this community, I learned a lot of things and I found it very interesting. Uh, do some people have questions? If it's the case, please raise your hand using the participants menu. Yes, we have a first question. Yes, thank you for your interesting and inspiring talk. But I have a clarification question concerning this definition of composition. Mm -hmm. um, you compose a game with an automaton. And then there is a value in the game 
and a value in the automaton. Mm -hmm. Now it's not clear whether Eve, in order to win, has to win both in the original game and in the automaton, or whether she just has to win in the automaton and that the outcome in the original game no longer is relevant. Uh, that's a good question. Um, so because of how we build this composition, any run that Eve will build in uh, the automaton part of the composition will be a run over the play that she has played in the, in the game part of the composition. So if she builds a good run, then that is a good run over the play that is played in the game. Um, so which implies that she managed to play something good in the original game. Uh, so indeed, uh, to uh, have a good outcome in this value, implicitly, she also has to have a good outcome in the original game. Uh, however, if we think about alternating automata, then things become a bit trickier, because there we would also have Adam making choices in the automaton, and then one way for Eve to win would be to trick Adam to make a bad choice in the automaton, in which case she might achieve a run that uh, is bad, uh, that is good for her, despite the word being played in the game being uh, bad for her. Uh, but yeah, in the non-deterministic case, winning in the composition implies winning in the game. Because you would expect that uh, by having this double requirement, it actually may be the case that there is no winning strategy because what she has to do in the automaton contradicts what she has to do in the original game. So that's not clear how this ever can work, <laughs> except in specific cases. Yes, yeah, so it works exactly, so it corresponds exactly to this uh, notion of history determinism, at least in the in the Boolean setting. Uh, the only way she can win in this composition is if all the choices she makes in the automaton, she can make them without knowing what is going to happen in the game. Good, thanks. Other questions maybe? No? So if not, uh, well, thank you all for attending. Thank you again, Carolina, for this talk. Really, really interesting. Uh, so the talk was recorded. Uh, so if you want to share it someday, uh, it will be record. It will be available on the web page at some point uh, when we process it in a few weeks, I guess. So thank you again, and uh, I wish you a nice afternoon, day, night, depending on where you are. Thank, thank you, and see you next week. Goodbye.